Well, it's good to have y'all in the house of the Lord tonight. Amen. Amen. Praise God. You know, I was thinking whenever I was coming up here, real quick, I was going to say this. Um, just, just real quick, like uh, everybody in, in the house, you know, I know that I can't keep everybody's attention the whole time. I, there's just no way. Number one, I'll probably preach too long. Really, I, I'll admit. Some of y'all will stay too, but some of you, I'm going to lose it. And number two, I don't know what else number two was, but I want to say this. For just three seconds, five seconds, 10, 15 seconds, give me your attention. When I was about to step up here, the Holy Spirit wanted me to ask you, what is it that you face today? What is it that you're thinking about when you walked into the house of God? <coughs> was today your first day of school? Was today, was today a hot day on the job? What was it today that's trying to steal your joy? What did you face that's trying to weigh you down? Because something's trying to weigh you down. The Lord wanted me to remind you today of who you encountered along the journey of your path. What kind of conversations you had. Who you talked to. What the context of your conversation was today. I want, now some of you in here, you're like, I'll tell you what it was, preacher. I gave somebody a book about salvation. I gave them a Bible. Hallelujah. Well, praise God. But somebody may be in this place. Your conversation was something different. I'm not here to beat you down. Don't take what I'm saying the wrong way. I'm just trying to make a point. What was our context of our conversation whenever we got amongst our friends or when we got amongst other people? And is it possible that the things that we talk about and the things that we fill our spirit with is part of the reason that we're getting... Wait, wait, listen back there in the sound booth. Yeah, we still got five seconds left. You know, that, that what is it that we engaged in today and whenever we feel heavy? Because, see, the song said that your name is like honey on my lips. Yeah. And I'm here to tell you tonight that if you can, one of the scriptures that I cut out in my message had to do with arm, hands that hang low and feeble knees. And it had to do with a foot that's lame and causes somebody to turn off to the wrong direction and they're going in the wrong direction. And sometimes that's what God's people look like. They look, their hands are hanging low and their knees are feeble. And, and really and truly, they, they're supposed to be walking upright. They're supposed to be walking upright because you see the Lord would tell you that he wants to lift the burden off of you. He said, come unto me, you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. The Lord wants you to know that if you will trust in him and hope in him, that he will take the weight and the burden off of you. That is the word of the living God. And I'm here to tell you tonight that if you would dare to start believing what his word says. He would start to move on your behalf and he would start to put, well, for lack of better words, a little bit of pep in his step. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I believe that. And that was just a word that I think the Lord wanted me to give you tonight for you to know that he loves you and that he wants to be there for you if, you, if we'll give him a chance. Amen. It's not, it doesn't happen overnight all the time, but praise God, it will happen if we'll trust him. Amen. So try something different tomorrow. Amen. Matter of fact, let me say this. If you love Jesus, and you hang around and talk to people that don't love Jesus, find some different people to hang around and talk to. Wow, that's a novel idea. Anyway, that's a word from a pastor who's hung around with people that didn't talk about Jesus or changed the atmosphere. Praise God, change the atmosphere. Brother Kirk got a song we play on prayer night and uh, they talk about changing the atmosphere. Hallelujah. The name of Jesus will change the atmosphere. Let me not, let me not talk about old stories. Praise God. Lord, give us new stories. Amen. In the name of Jesus. Have you ever noticed that before? If you've never used the name of Jesus in public, you should try that. It's an amazing thing. It starts shaking stuff up. Hallelujah. And, yeah, and we, it, sometimes it'll make people really excited. Sometimes it'll make people really uncomfortable. That's right. Amen. But guess what? It will shake up some stuff. I like to just see what it does. <laughs> Praise God. All right. Well, look, you know, about five nights ago, I promise you, about five nights ago or five mornings ago, I woke up and the first word that I heard, you're going to think it's bad, but it wasn't bad. The first word I heard when I woke up was bitterness. Bitterness was in my head. So you know what I knew? I knew that the Lord wanted me to preach messages on bitterness. Now, in the end, the prayer and the hope is that we're not bitter. Hallelujah. The hope, and I don't even know that any of you are bitter. But I want you to know, I want to talk to you a little bit about bitterness tonight. The Lord wants to explain some things about bitterness. He wants to make us aware of it. And I didn't really give tonight a title, but if I was, I'd say, 
don't stay bitter, get better, or get better, don't be bitter, or something to that nature. Because, see, God doesn't want you bitter. God wants you better. God wants to heal you of that problem. Amen. I wrote a little bit about bitterness. Bitterness is a word that is used frequently throughout the Scripture. Sometimes in Scripture, it's words like wormwood or gall. If you're a person that reads the Word of God, sometimes you'll come across the words wormwood or gall. Those words are used synonymously or interchangeably for the word bitter. Mostly bitterness kind of evokes the idea of a spiritually poisonous problem that targets the heart. Various circumstances can initiate bitterness. Uh, you know, loss of life, loss of finances, loss of friends, friends or family turning on a person, mistreatment by someone that you care about. Listen, growing up as a child, I had a lot of memories of opportunity where the enemy wanted to strike me with bitterness. You know, there's a lot of things that I couldn't remember, but I got this vivid imagination. Mom, I'm not trying to make you sad back there. But I can remember one time you saying, your daddy said he's going to come get you for baseball practice. We had moved back from Singapore. It was in the fourth grade. We lived north side Lafayette. And I remember being in that bedroom. And I remember looking outside the window waiting for him to come. And I remember you telling me, but Matthew, you know, sometimes he doesn't do what he said he's going to do. And I can remember looking outside that window and he never showed up. And I'm just trying to say that, and I'm not trying to make you feel sad for me because hallelujah, the Lord knows how to turn stuff around. But what I'm trying to tell you is I'm not the only one with little stories. Some of y'all got worse stories than I got, right? But what I'm here to tell you is this, is that the Lord wants to make us bitter. He doesn't want us to live in the midst of bitterness. He wants us to be better. I did say he wants to make us bitter. I yeah. didn't say he wants to make us better. That's a lie. Pull that out of the video. Praise God. Any place where humans congregate is subject to an invasion of bitterness. People in churches, pastors, workers, bosses, teachers, students, anyone at any time is susceptible to the seed of bitterness entering in and growing and turning from a seed to a root and from a root to produce fruit, the fruit of bitterness. This fruit isn't, isn't sweet, of course, it's not as bitter and it's poisonous. I remember learning something in nursing school about bitter taste buds. Bitter taste buds are so important. See, savory, salty taste buds, sweet taste buds, sour taste buds. Kids love their little sour patch candies and stuff like that. All those kinds of taste buds kind of like cause a little stimulation and woohoo! Like my daughter Bella, she's like, Dad, those capers, mom's gonna be mad. She came home for a little bit. She just went to Hawaii and did some skydiving. That was pretty crazy. But look, she came home the other day before she went to Hawaii and she ate all the capers. Uh oh, Miss Angela, you might be mad. So I said, baby, what are you doing? She said, I'll probably get in trouble, but it's more salty than a pickle, and I love it. So all these different kind of taste buds, they stimulate, they scintillate, but guess what? Bitter taste buds? You don't want to stimulate your bitter taste buds, buddy. Ain't nobody like your bitter. But you know what? Bitter taste buds are our most important. You know why? They signal a problem. Because, see, good stuff for you is not supposed to be bitter. Bitter taste buds stimulated can mean, or warning, poison could be in your mouth. Stop drinking what you're drinking. It could be that it's not good for you. You need to pay attention to what you just put in, in your mouth. No one likes the stimulation of bitter taste buds. Fruit created by God is sweet. It brings nutrition and life. Whether it grows on a tree or flows from a heart, fruit from God brings life. But bitterness is a poison from Satan. Bitterness is a poison from Satan, and it's one of the tools in his belt that he uses to bring widespread destruction to people's lives. So the definition of bitter, some words that describe bitter, it grieved him, provoked him, it easily angers or irritates him. See, when you have bitterness that's growing in your heart, what one of the things that you'll know, I'm not talking about every now and then you get irritated, because Lord knows... It, life is like that sometimes. You might do something that irritates me. I feel irritation. But as a man of God, I'm supposed to recognize that. Kind of interesting today. My brother Brendan preached in the jail in Centerville today. Hey, brother, let me tell you something. The anointing flowed through that, brother. It was a blessing to be there. Hallelujah. And, you know, 
Brendan even talked about bitterness a little bit today, and if I get to it, I'll mention that. But one guy that was in the service, this is the second time this has happened to him because he said he was irritated with me last time. Really and truly, I did. I laid hands on him, and I came against a demonic assignment over his life. But really, I think that he really has a problem where the enemy is trying to to frustrate him because last time it was me and he got up and he admitted it. But you know, that's part of the remedy to bitterness. Part of the remedy to bitterness is to admit you got a problem and to humble yourself and to bring it out. And I'm going to talk about that if we get to the end and let it be exposed in the light. Yes. God doesn't want things to be hidden. God wants things to be exposed in the light for us to bring it to God and for us to make to come clean with it. To God, so every now and then we might feel irritated, that's one thing. But whenever I'm easily provoked and constantly irritated, and specifically sometimes towards a certain person or a certain place or circumstances, and I'm constantly walking around with a spirit of irritation on the inside of me, that's a sign that you got a root of bitterness that's growing on the inside of you. You gotta be careful. You gotta learn how to eradicate a root of bitterness, because if you don't, it will destroy. Your walk. It will destroy your walk with God. Hebrews 12, 14 and 15 he gives a warning to believers. He says this, follow peace with all men and holiness. Without which no man shall see the Lord. Looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you. And thereby Many be defiled. You know, the word trouble means to be something's malfunctioning. Something's not working right. You know, you remember a while back, we were talking a lot about the Holy Spirit. And I talked to you about the symbol of the dove. That the dove is a type of the Holy Spirit. We see that in the scripture. Whenever Jesus was baptized, the spirit descended upon him like a dove. And, and even in the Noah's Ark story, we see that the Holy Spirit is a clean animal. Right? How do we know that? Because... The, the, whenever Noah released the raven, the raven didn't come back. A raven is an unclean animal. It is a carnivore. It is an animal that will eat decaying flesh. A dove will not do that. Likely floating kind or cows upon the water decaying. The raven found its home and was happy and came to rest upon decaying flesh. And it, and, and it was happy to not return. But the dove returned and, and, and brought up. And finally one day the dove returned. And what did he bring? He brought an olive branch. And that has become the symbol of peace internationally. The dove is a clean animal and it likes clean environments. The Holy Spirit likes clean environments. The Holy Spirit is sweet. He likes a calm and a restful environment. He's not comfortable with commotion and chaos and mess. A spirit that is full of bitterness is a spirit that is full of chaos and a place that the spirit of God is not really comfortable making that place a habitat. So if you're walking around with a spirit of heaviness and you're full of bitterness, it's a place that the Holy Spirit, I'm not saying he doesn't want to be with you. Of course he wants to be with you. He wants every opportunity to come to you and to minister to you and give you strength. But if you're walking around with chaos and commotion and confusion and bitterness in your heart, he doesn't feel comfortable. In that environment. Job said this about bitterness. He said, my soul is weary of my life. I will leave my complaint upon myself. I will speak in the bitterness of my soul. Job, Job lost his whole family. And later was stricken with boils. And he didn't even know why this was going on. If you read the story, we have the privilege of knowing that God had a conversation with Satan. But Job didn't know that. Job thought he was doing good. He was serving the Lord. And all this stuff happens to him. And he says, I'm going to complain from the bitterness of my soul. But in the end, Job realized, see, many times bitterness comes with discontentment. I'm not happy with my situation. I'm not happy with my circumstance. Right. And so all of a sudden, bitterness tries to rise up in me. But let me tell you something about Job. When it was all said and done, Job said this in Job 23, verse 10. Well, let me just say it like this. Starting in verse eight. He said, I go forward, but he's not there backward. But I can't perceive him on the left hand he, where he does work. But I cannot behold him. He hides himself on my right hand. I can't see him, but he knows the way that I take. Look at verse 10. When he has tried me, I shall come 
court as gold. My foot has held his steps. His way have I kept and not declined. Neither have I gone back from the commandment of his lips. I have esteemed the words of his mouth more than my necessary food. Job said, oh, even though my soul feels bitter, I'm going to hold on to it. Listen to me, saints. I'm not trying to get mean. I'm not trying to talk like my daddy, the Marine. I'm trying to ask a question, though. What in the world is going on with us that we're so bad in America that we can't give God glory, that we can't hope in Him and trust in Him and to believe that He can get us past bitterness, that He can get us past heaviness, that He can get us past sorrow. Whenever Job said it, he said, I feel weary. I'm but I'm beat down, but I'm going to hold on to him because I know something. Job knew something about his God, my friend. What did he know? He knew that if he held on to him, he'd come forth like gold. He'd come forth like gold tried in the fire. I want to encourage you. That's the word of God. When you go through the trial and you hold on to Jesus, you will come forth like gold. The proverb said that, that the fire the refiner's fire, when it gets hot enough, see, it melts that gold. When the fire gets hot enough, it melts the gold. And what happens is the impurities. It's called dross. Yeah. Dross in the Bible. It's the impurities that's in the metal. It rises to the top. Then the refiner can see it. When he, does, he removes it from off the top. And then he can see his reflection in the gold when it becomes pure. Then he pours it into a mold. And he makes a vessel that's worthy of the refiner. See, so instead of us walking around, Lord, help us. Help help the preacher. Because the enemy sure enough would like to put some bitterness on me. He sure enough would like to put some heaviness on me, but I ain't taking it. I'm not going to take it. I ain't drinking from that cup. Hold on a second. We're going to get there. I ain't drinking from that cup. I got another cup I need to drink from. Oh, hallelujah. I got another cup that my Jesus told me to drink. He led the way. He showed me what cup to drink. And it sure enough ain't the cup of bitterness. Praise God. And I'm going to drink after that cup. But look, Lord, if you got to increase the fire, increase the fire, Lord. Increase the fire, remove the dross, and make me a vessel that can be used. Hey, listen, in Exodus 15, 23 through 25, the Lord brought the children of Israel to a place. It says when they came to Mara. It says when they came to Mara, they could not drink of the waters of Mara. Why? They were bitter. Therefore, the name of it was called Myra. And the people murmured against Moses, saying, What shall we drink? And he cried unto the Lord, and the Lord showed him a tree, which when he cast it into the waters, the waters were made sweet. There he made for them a statute and an ordinance, and there he proved them. The word proved means he put them to the test. The Lord put them to the test at the bitter waters of Mara. We're going to talk about that a little bit more, but hallelujah for that tree. We know, many of us in this room know that we would equate the tree to being the cross and that when we put the cross in our life, it changes bitter waters into sweet waters. We need to break that down a little bit more and before the message is over, we'll break it down a little bit more. What does that even mean? What I do, just throw the cross? What you want me to do, preacher? You want me to grab this cross and go throw it in the water of, the, of Lake Pelord or something to turn it sweet? No, it's more than that. You got to put what Jesus did for you in the sacrifice, put faith that Jesus' death gives you access to grace and the grace of the Holy Spirit. Is it, it'll make your day might be bad. Somebody might have told you something mean. And when you and, and you know what you realize? I need to walk away from this. Yeah. This person's trying to put bitterness on me. Yeah. And instead I'm gonna walk away from this. Yeah. And then I say, Jesus. Oh, and the next thing you know, I was walking like this. Yes, and next thing you know, I started standing up right and I said, Jesus. What? Oh, Jesus, your name is like honey on my lips. Your spirit's like water to my soul. Hallelujah. I wish I could, but I can't. Praise God. I sing better than some singers, man. Not none of this church. <laughs> Sabrina's like, I really do. That was way, way, way out there. Sorry, sis. All right, I'll, keep, I'll stay in my lane. Praise God. The testing, though. You know, this was a test. He said he, he proved them. That word proved there, I've seen it over and over in the King James Bible. It means to put them to the test. Mm, come on. I wonder if it's true. Because, you see, I'm not going to 
Rabbi Ron. Hallelujah. Isn't that good, dude? I got some life left in me. When Re Rabbi Ron, 82 years old, walking around talking like that, I'm like, dude, I got some ministry left in me, bro. By the grace of the Holy Spirit, keep my body going, Lord. But you know, he confirmed things that the Lord's been speaking to me. And I've tried to say, it. maybe some of y'all remember, maybe you don't. The Word of God says in Isaiah 66, it says that the eyes of the Lord run to and fro. And they're looking to light upon a person that has a broken and a contrite spirit. Yeah. One that trembles at his word. Dude, I preached that for about three weeks way back when the Lord first started moving. <laughs> and what the Lord had been saying is, son, what I'm looking for is a people. That I can trust with my spirit. So I wrote in here, I wonder if it's true that if God is looking for a place where people's hearts are broken and contrite. He's looking for a place where he can pour out his spirit and touch with fire from his finger to set it ablaze. Now listen to me. Let me, let me say this. Let me remind you what we should all be in agreement of at this point in time. I believe that we're all in agreement that we're in the last days. What does that mean? I don't know. You figure it out. Get along with the Holy Spirit. I'm telling you we're in the last days. It's pretty obvious. Yes. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to figure that out. Amen? Yeah. All, right. All right. So we're in the last days, and we agree that most of us are in agreement that the Holy Spirit wants to pour out His Spirit yes. upon all flesh. Because actually it says in the latter days, He's going to pour out His Spirit on all flesh. Yes. And we believe that even as Rabbi Ron was talking about and confirming some of the things that we've already heard Solomon talk about, what the Lord had already put in my heart even before Solomon came, that there's, good, that there's a great harvest because it's written in the Word of God. We don't even need these men of God to tell us this. Thank God they did and thank God they stand under the anointing, but it's in the Word of God. Yeah. All we got to do is read the Word of God and we can see that there's a great harvest that runs throughout the whole pages of Scripture. And we know that God is going to harvest souls from the earth. Amen. And, and so and, and the way that he prepares the crop is that he pours out latter day rain. He pours out the presence of his Holy Spirit to bring a bumper crop because that's how the Holy Spirit works. It's how he worked at the day of Pentecost. As he poured out his spirit, the, the, the souls were added to the church. You think if he didn't do that at the beginning of the church age that he's not going to do it at the end? No, he is. And so what I'm trying to say is, is that the Holy Spirit is looking for hearts that are broken and contrite and a place where he can pour his spirit out. I wonder if God would test a place like that. Oh, yeah. See, because the Lord's been saying it, and you know, even Wade said it many weeks ago when we went to go master, uh, meet Pastor Butch. I feel like we're in a training period or a testing period. The Lord's been speaking that to me. Will you be a people that I can entrust with? No, will you be a person that he can entrust with his spirit? Will I be a person that he can entrust with his spirit? Will we be a people that he can entrust with his spirit? I wonder if he would test a place like that before he just pours it out. Maybe give the person or the church, even a church like ours, just a little taste of it first. Give you a taste of it and then back up a little bit and see what happens. See how you handle that. See how you respond to the moving and operation of the Holy Spirit. See if we appreciate the presence of the Lord. See if we let it do anything in our hearts and change us. Make us grateful for experiencing the, the presence of the Lord. Right? And maybe even, you know, like I said, back up a little bit. Do they respect Him and His presence, these people? You know, talking about the test... The word Mara, it means bitter, right? And the immediate reaction of them trying to ingest this bitterness was murmuring. So when you try to ingest bitterness, whether you realize it or not, listen to me, church. I want you to know, let me, let me make it real time for you. If, if bitter taste buds warn you that you put something in your mouth that could be poisonous, there's also something that can warn you. What I want you to know is, is that there's symptoms, just like the bitter taste buds are stimulated when you put something poisonous in your mouth. You and I, and I told that young man, I told him and I told them, we got to start recognizing when that irritation feeling starts coming over. Like if I say something to Sabrina and that just irritates the mess out of you, or if I say something to Brother Bill and all of a sudden, or Brother Kirk, and you feel this, this overwhelming feeling of irritation come over you. That's not the Holy Spirit, my friend. Hello? That's 
the enemy and he's trying to put some bitter poison in you. And it starts off like a seed. And if you let it stay in there, it starts growing like a root. And you can't see a root because it's under the surface. And it's getting bigger and it's getting meaner and it's getting uglier. And the next thing you know, it takes over and it starts messing with your mind and it messes with your heart. And you're frustrated towards that person. And instead of having love for them, like the Holy Spirit would want you to have so that you could pray for them. Instead, you're talking about them and you're slandering them and you're gossiping about them. And you're frustrated and you're irritated. And it's getting worse. And the spirit of heaviness is getting on you because the dove don't like that in heart. It's like a dirty bird bath. He says, I ain't landing right there. Give me a clean bird bath where I can flit around and play around and splash around. I can have move in your heart and in your life and heal you. That's good. They responded by murmuring. God had a plan beforehand. Look, you know what I'm saying? Look, so you think God didn't know that waters were bitter? No, really. Think about it. You think he didn't already know the waters were bitter? The tree was there. He knew the waters were bitter. Yet the Lord purposely led them to the bitter waters of water. Why? Why would you do that, Lord? Well, it was to put them to the test. You know, the tree represents the cross, but every trial of life provides an opportunity for applying the cross to the situation or to self for death. That's what the cross does, right? The cross is an instrument of death. Well, what are you talking about, preacher? You want me to die? No, I don't want you to die. I want your flesh to die. I want my flesh to die. Yes. I want my bad attitude to die. Yes. I want my self righteousness oh. to die. I want my pride to die. I want my my bad my gossip mouth, yes. my bad mouth, my cursing yes. mouth, my bad language. I want my desire for my eyes to look upon yes. unholy things, unclean things, things that are not pleasant to the dove of the Holy Spirit. I want that stuff to die. Hallelujah! Because that's what the Word of God says. I'm not talking to you about something that Matt wants. I'm talking to you something about what the Holy Spirit wants in your life. Yes. Amen? Amen. Yes. Every trial provides that opportunity for, for the situation or for self to die. Verse is allowing bitterness to remain, which will result in murmuring, which will make God more angry. How does one apply the cross? The cross is always about death to self, death to the flesh. Death to the old ways of response. It's not okay anymore, mature Christian woman of God, mature Christian man of God, that when you get irritated for you to be ugly. No more excuses. No, that's just how I am. No, nope, that's not going to work anymore. That's not going to work anymore. Stop it in the name of Jesus. I'm not saying any of y'all are doing it. I'm just trying to say, stop it in the name of Jesus. Quit being rude. Jesus ain't rude. Jesus tells the truth, but he's not rude. Yeah, if people ain't right, pray for them. Yeah. And Pastor Matt, Shelby, when you got to go back, pray for Pastor Matt. Hallelujah. Pray. For, if Pastor Matt ain't doing something right, pray for him. Yeah. Yeah. Don't hate him. Yeah. 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 Don't hate me. Yeah. Yeah. I need help. I need help, Lord. Because preachers can get bitter. Come on, but my point is, is that you're not going to convince me that, that, that God did not prepare that test for them. He knew the bitter, the waters were bitter. He had a tree already planned, but yet he still brought them to the bitter waters. And I'm thinking he wanted to see how they were going to respond. So when God leads you to a place that could cause bitterness, I'm trying to say, I think he's trying to test you. Yes. He's trying to test you. He's trying to test me to see how we're going to respond. You know, this isn't just speculation, I'm telling you. Now, I don't know if you're ready to put a scripture up there or not, Amy, but if you can put up Deuteronomy 8.2. Deuteronomy 8.2, this isn't speculation I'm talking about. I'm talking about this is the word of the Lord. Look what he said. And thou shalt remember all the way which the Lord thy God led thee these 40 years in the wilderness to humble you, to prove you, in other words, to put you to the test, to know what was in your heart, whether you would keep his commandments or not. No, God allowed the 40 years of the wandering in the wilderness for a purpose, to put them to the test, to check, to show them what was in their heart. The Holy Spirit wants to show you and I what is in our heart so that we can see it and that we can give it to him and let him have it. Amen. He wants to make us better. He doesn't want us to live in bitterness. So in that story about the bitter waters of Mari, y'all remember the story of Ruth? Okay, listen, if you don't, it's okay. 
go back and read it. It's only four chapters. It's short. You talk about a good little read. Yes. The book of Ruth. Oh my goodness. That is such a good book. Let me just tell you real quick. The book of Ruth takes place during the time frame of the judges. They lived in Bethlehem. Ruth, I'm sorry, Naomi, okay, was married to a man named Elimelech. They had two sons. There was a famine in Bethlehem. You know the name Bethlehem literally means the house of bread. Okay, but there was a famine in the house of bread. That's where Jesus was born. Hallelujah, bread from heaven, born in the house of bread. You, you can't even make this stuff up. And they got a whole world out there that's perishing and doesn't even believe God's real. Lord, help them. Help them, right? And so anyway, there's a famine in the house of bread. And Naomi and Elimelech and, and, Kale and uh, I can't even remember their, her book, Malon and Kalazion, I think is their names. They take off to Moab. The last thing you're supposed to do when times get tough is to leave the house of the Lord. You're not supposed to do that, child of God. But that's what they did. They left and they went to Moab, a place where the Moabites worship a God named Chemosh that demands child sacrifice. You ain't supposed to go over there. What you doing? So their sons end up marrying two women over there. I think one of them's name was Orpah and the other one's name is Ruth. All right. And so guess what happens? Elimelech dies. Kalazion dies. Malon dies. They all die. And Naomi now is all left by herself. And then she hears that there's bread again in Bethlehem. So you know what she's going to do? I'm going back to the home of my forefathers. Hello. <laughs> I'm going back to where my God lives. And, and, and Ruth said, oh, I want to come with you. Or, but she said, I'm going to go back to my people. You know, Naomi said, no, you don't want to come with me. Ruth said, no, I'm coming with you, my friend. I'm coming with you, and your God is going to be my God. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, listen, they show up in town. I can see it now. They're walking down the streets of Bethlehem, and all the people are coming outside to see, look at this. Look who's back. Look, it's Naomi, guys. Hey, everybody, Naomi came back to town. And she said, don't call me Naomi. Call me Myra. Call me Myra because the Lord has dealt with me bitterly. Okay. Wait, hold on a second, Mama. What you talking about? The Lord never told you to leave the house of bread just because there was a famine in the land? No, you made a choice. Come on, Christian. Yes. Let us quit blaming God yes. for the choices that we make. And listen to me. I'm talking about some serious, serious stuff here. We find ourselves in the midst of the trial. The enemy's attacking us. He's coming at us from different angles. And the Lord is allowing us to be brought to the bitter waters to put us to the test to see how we're going to respond. Whether or not we're going to murmur against him. Whether or not we're going to get frustrated. Whether or not we're going to pack our bags and move to another town. Or whether or not we're going to trust him like Job and say, Hey, when I get through this trial, I'm going to come forth like gold. Help us, Lord. Yes. And the Lord showed up for Naomi. It's a good story, a great ending. Ruth married Boaz. Yes. Boaz and Ruth had a son named Obed. Obed had a son named Jesse. Jesse had a son named David. Hallelujah. Yes. King David! Woo. Oh, that's a good story right there. You know, another thing I noticed about bitterness is that bitter parties are drawn to each other like magnets. Yes. Genesis chapter 28 verse 9 says this. It's talking about Esau. Y'all know the story of Esau? Esau is all bitter. He's all tore up. Why? Because Jacob stole his birthright. He didn't even care about that birthright. He said, just give me a bowl of lentils. Just give me some stew. I don't care about that old birthright. He showed up one of that blessing that was connected to the birthright, though. That double portion blessing that was supposed to be to help him to carry on the posterity of the family because the whole family unit is what makes up the clans, which makes up the tribes, which makes up the nation of Israel, which has the glory of the Lord and happy. In the, in the earth and God said don't sell the land God said that, that it belongs to me and God said you are my people and Esau despised the birthright but he showed up one of the blessing no the blessing is so that you can keep up with the birthright my boy and you sold it for a bowl of stew didn't even have beef in it wow. <laughs> didn't even have venison in it it was a bowl of beans man and now he's now he's bitter and you know what he did? It says right here. You got the scripture? Uh, Genesis 28, 9. If not, I'll read it. Then went Esau to Ishmael. Oh, wow. Ishmael, another bitter seed. And he took unto the wives, which he had, Mahalath, the daughter of Ishmael. You know her name means disease. Wow. Abraham's son, the sister of Nebuchadnezzar, to be his wife. Wow. Wow. And her name means disease, sickness. 
And two bitter seeds, Ishmael bitter because what? He was kicked out of the camp, right? Because he wasn't the promised seed, Isaac was. Esau bitter, goes and finds a wife from Ishmael. Wow. Lord, listen, you got to be careful, man. You got to be careful when you're in the house of the Lord. If you hear people with a bitter tongue talking to you, I'm not here to control you. That's between you and the Holy Ghost, how you handle your business. I'm trying to warn you to help you. That if you hear somebody spewing bitter poison, you don't want to drink from that cup. Amen. Amen. You know, sometimes circumstances in the book of Exodus, Exodus 1, 13 and 14, it says that the Egyptians made the children of Israel to serve with rigor, hardness. They made their lives bitter with hard bondage and mortar. And in brick and in all manner of service in the field, all their service wherein they made them serve was with rigor. <laughs> and the only reason I'm kind of chuckling a little bit is because sometimes I've had jobs where I felt, <laughs> I felt like that. I'm like, boy, this is, I started to call, I told one of my bosses one time, but I had a relationship. I'm like, man, dude, you ain't like the emperor of Rome, dude. You like Pharaoh, man. <laughs> Go make them bricks, boy. Go make more bricks and I'm good. Now you got to get your own straw. Right, and and you know sometimes you feel like that, especially whenever you in when you have a job that's got a lot of business, right? And it's like, man, you're busy, 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 working hard, working hard, and sometimes you don't feel like the man. You feel like you're working for the man, and the man ain't really paying you like you should be paid. D dude, you thought that that was only your problem? No, man, you silly dude. That's everybody's problem. We all feel like a bunch of Hebrew slaves half the times. Half the time, we are a bunch of Hebrew slaves. But you know what? Hallelujah. If you need a job, thank you, Jesus, for a job. Yes. One thing that, and listen, I ain't trying to make too big of a deal about this, but one thing that pleases me more than anything. I'm not trying to make you feel weird, but but after we got pre done preaching at the church uh, at the jail, thank you guys for letting him do that. By the way, um, praise God. After we got done preaching at the jail, he said, well, "Look, man, can you drop me off at the job site? I got my clothes in the back." He jumped up in the trailer, he changed his clothes, and within about five minutes, he was holding that two by six, and they were nailing. And I was like, "Wow, praise God! Look at that!" And he went from preaching to working. Praise God! And all I'm trying to say is that's a that's a good sign. Because guess what? We need a job. We need industry. And, and sometimes instead of looking like at the man, amen, like he's trying to hold you down, if we start praying for the man, if we start praying that the Lord would give him business, and if we start being the first one on the job, the last one to leave, have a good attitude, hallelujah, the productivity comes in. Well, praise God. I can tell you one thing. If your boss is not a Christian, then all you can do is pray that the hand of the Lord will touch his heart. But if he is a Christian, there's a word in Ephesians that says to the masters, to the bosses, not to withhold that which is due unto the worker, unto the servant. Okay, the same thing for the servant, though. Work as unto the Lord. Get your eyes off that man that you think is treating you wrong. Get your eyes off of him. And understand you ain't working for the man. You're working yes. for the man. Hallelujah. And if you'll do that and ask the Lord to work in your heart, he'll soften you up. He'll make things better. Because guess what? Your witness is connected to your work ethic. It just is. Because you can sit there all day long and talk to somebody about Jesus. And if you have a poor work ethic, number one, your boss ain't going to want to hear about your testimony. And number two, the people that you work with, that they over there having to pick up your slack. Trust me, guess what's happening to them? A root of bitterness is growing in their heart towards you. So um, that's some good preaching right there. Whether you said whether it felt good or not, it's another story. That was some good stuff. Amen. That's the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Thank you, Lord. The word of the Lord says in Ezekiel, he said, a new heart I will give you, a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away your stony heart out of your flesh and I will give you a heart of flesh. Yes. God promised in the Old Testament that in the new covenant, he would do a miracle to our heart. Yes. He'd give us a heart that he could deal with. Then he tells us in Proverbs 4.23, watch over your heart with all diligence for, for, for from it flow the springs of life. See, bitterness wants to attack your heart. Mm -hmm. And it wants to mess up your heart. Yes. But the word of the Lord says to watch over it with diligence. Why? Because from it flows the springs of life. You see, whatever's in your heart is going to come out. Jesus said that. Right? He said, no, man. It doesn't matter if you eat without washing. What goes in the mouth is and what defiles a man that comes out the other side. It's what comes out of a man's mouth that defiles him because there shows what's in the heart. That's good. Help us. 
We're not going to talk about it a whole bunch, but we talk about Passover all the time, right? They applied the blood to the doorpost. But, you know, they had to do that every year, right? They would have to do the Passover meal every year. And you know what part of the Passover meal was? And I asked Rabbi Ron, I already kind of felt like I knew the answer, but I just double checked with it. Hey, the bitter herbs y'all y'all eat every year. That's to remind y'all huh, of how bitter it was in Egypt. You got that right? Yeah. To remind us that it was bitter, but the Lord delivered us. See, I don't want to go back to bitterness, Christian. I've been bitter before. I don't want to go back to bitterness because it's going to mess up my walk with the Lord. Had I been bitter, towards that person, right? It, they might not have even been affected by it, but it would have affected me. That's what bitterness does. The other person might be going on. They might not have even known they did nothing wrong to you, really. They might not even, and that's their problem. You might want to say, but no, I'm not moving forward till you understand, sir or ma'am, what you did to me. You need to know what you did to me. Okay. Well, there's an answer for that. The Word of God says that if you're coming to bring your gift to the altar, I don't know whose money that is. I'm going to put it back. I'm coming to bring my gift to the altar. Hallelujah. We'll put it in this bucket. Before you put your gift at the altar, if you remember that your brother has ought against you, go ahead and tuck it back in your pocket because the Lord don't want your gift right now. What he wants you to do is he wants you to go to your brother and your sister that you got ought in your heart or they got ought in their heart towards you. He wants you to go make it right. Yes. Then come on back. You put your gift at the altar. Hallelujah. He wants you to do business. He's more worried about your heart than he is your pocketbook. The Lord's going to take care of the church. You let the Holy Spirit take care of your heart. Amen? Is that a good word? I, I mean, it has to be because it's the word of the Lord. <laughs> Praise God. Yes. Thank you, Jesus. You know, there's a story in 2 Kings chapter 4, verses 38 through 41. One time, we had a guy here named Luke Pogue. I think I want to reach out to old Luke and get him to come back and preach. Man, that's some good preaching that brother did. He preached about this story. At 2 Kings 4, 38 through 41, it says, Elisha came to Gilgal. There was a dearth in the land. That means a famine. The sons of the prophets were sitting before him. And he said unto his servants, set on the great pot and seethe pottage. What does that mean? Put a big pot on the fire. Let's make a stew. Let's make a pottage. That's really what Esau sold his birthright for. For the sons of the prophets. And one went out into the field to gather herbs. And look at this. He found a wild vine. It's kind of like a gourd. It's kind of like some wild squash growing somewhere. Yeah, if you don't know what it is, don't put it in the pot. And they put it in the, they put it in the pot. They, uh, they gathered up the wild gourds that's lack full and came and shred them into the pot of pottage, for they knew them not. So they poured out for the men to eat. And it came to pass as they were eating of the pottage that they cried out. And guess what happened? Their bitter taste buds got stimulated. Oh, they cried out. Oh, man of God, there's death in the pot. And they could not eat thereof. But he said, bring the meal, flour, a type of Jesus. Put Jesus in the pot. Hallelujah. And he cast it into the pot. And he said, pour out for the people that they may eat. And there was no more harm in the pot. What is the point? Don't go grabbing a whole bunch of stuff outside the covenant of the Lord and putting that in your pot and cooking that up and eating it. Don't go grab that stuff in the world. Don't venture out there. Don't let the stuff on the outside come in and start messing with you. Hold on to the stuff that you know is right. Amen. Psalm 69, verses 20 and 21. This is a psalm that speaks about Jesus. Because Jesus quoted from this psalm. He said, reproach has broken my heart. The word reproach means scorn. The idea is, is that they really don't think anything about what's happening to me right now. You know, you know, the world mocked him. The religion mocked him. They laughed at him as he hung on the cross. Look at you. Who was going to rebuild the temple in three days? Why? You can't even save yourself. How are you going to save anybody else? The thieves, he side cast the same in his teeth. They made fun of him. Yeah. And look what Jesus says. Look what the psalmist says as he prophesies a thousand years in advance of Jesus. Reproach has broken my heart. That's how Jesus. And I'm full of heaviness. And I looked for some to take pity, but there was none. And for comforters, but I found none. Look at this. 
But they gave me also gall for my meat. Mm -hmm. And in my thirst, they gave me yeah. vinegar to drink. Imagine the sorrow of separation. You know, we can apply this to our own lives. And at times, God seems silent. Sometimes it's sin. Sometimes it's a test, right? But if we'll seek him, we have the promise that he, we will find him. He said, draw near me and I will draw near you. One of the things that we need to understand about Jesus is the fact that he suffered many things in multiple ways to purchase grace that we would need in order to be able to walk in victory over sin, but also over the pains caused by the fallen world. How many times have people hurt you? How many times have you felt like you were being selfless and sacrificial to help other people? And the response was that they could not care a red cent about how their decisions would affect you. They didn't think about you when they made their decisions, not one little bit. Isn't that sad? Here Jesus is dying for the sins of the whole world. Everybody's mocking him. His disciples fell asleep and then forsook him, right? I mean, you do realize that they left him, right? And for a moment, my sin. Now I don't need to talk about your sin. Matt, Pastor Matt's sin for a moment caused the father to look away from him. He peers through his periphery, through swollen eyes, and he says, reproach. They see me as worthless. They see me as despicable. And it's broken my heart. With the rejection that the very people he came to save, Satan is trying to make him drink the cup of bitterness. Can you imagine that? What a game changer that would be. Had he drunk the cup of bitterness at the wrong time, How did he let bitterness enter in until his father told him that he could drink? I like Matthew 27, 34, when he quotes it, he says they gave, it's, well, Matthew says, they gave him vinegar to drink mingled with gall, and when he had tasted thereof, he would not drink it. And I'm not going to drink this cup. I'm not drinking this cup because I got another cup to drink that my Lord told me to drink, and he handed me that cup in the garden of Gethsemane. I said, Lord, if it be possible, take this cup from me. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. That's the cup. The cup of sacrifice, the cup of selflessness. He's asked every one of us to drink from that cup. Whenever you gave your heart and your life to Jesus, whether you wanted to or not, whether you like it or not, the more you read the Bible, the more you're going to realize he's asking every one of us to drink that cup. And the enemy wants to get you to drink that other cup. Yes. So what is the remedy, my friend? John chapter 30, verses 19 through 21. We're about to close. John says, this is the condemnation. Light is coming to the world. Men loved darkness rather than light. Roots of bitterness love darkness. Again, I don't mean to keep being redundant, but a root is under the surface and you can't see it. Roots grow in the dark. Condemnation that light is coming to the world. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that does evil hates the light, neither comes to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that does truth comes to the light, that his deeds may be made manifest, that they are wrought in God. You know, it must be brought to the light. Roots, like I said, are under the surface. If you want the root of bitterness to die, it needs to be brought out of the open. Most of the time, if I'm going to be honest with you, when people have a root of bitterness, they don't even know they have a root of bitterness. Because as a root of bitterness sets in, what will happen is it starts to sear the conscience. And, and this conscience is no longer stimulated by the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And the only way, really, if you're going to apply the cross to this. See, we can talk about the cross all day long and the easy, simplified version of me to say it is. That it's not just the cross when he died for our sin, but it's the cross to give us the grace that we need right. to live in victory yes. over sin right. each and every day. What Jesus' obedience did yeah. gives us access to the grace of God that empowers us to live for the Lord. Same cross that saved us is the same cross that sanctifies right. us. But can I tell you something? It's more than just saying I have faith in the cross because the cross also has action to it. And see, one of the action things of the cross is this. That you you want to know a good way to let self die? Say you're sorry and you mean it. Oh! Oh! Really? Preacher? Yeah. 
say you're sorry and mean it. Yeah. Oh, no! No, yeah, really. It's not really that hard. <laughs> oh, it is whenever you're full of pride yeah. and you refuse to believe that you had any fault in the matter and that it's everybody else's fault. Yeah. Help us, Lord. But see, if something's festering on the inside of you and the Lord's been dealing with you about it, the Lord wants you to bring it to the light. Yes. At least start with you and the Holy Spirit. Can we, can we agree with that? Can we at least start with you and the Holy Let me tell you a story one time, and you can leave this on there. I was going to Cornerstone Ministries, and the Lord was telling me it was time for me to move, right? And what ended up happening is I went in and I told the pastor I was leaving because that's just the right thing to do. So listen, if you start coming to the church, look, I'm just being real with you. If you start coming to the church and you're paying tithes and you're part of the church, can you at least, and if I did something wrong to you, believe me, it's possible because the Lord knows he's still working on me, right? Took him just a day to make the moon and the stars, Jupiter and Mars, and he's still working on me. Hallelujah. So it's possible. And, and, and if you don't know me by now, you know I didn't mean to do it. I don't want to hurt nobody. Because you know why? I'm going to have to stand before the Lord and give an account for it. So the last thing I want to do is hurt anybody. So I would prefer if you come talk to me. But I understand sometimes that feels a little weird. Okay. Please don't just leave and not come talk to me. Right? But anyway, so I felt like I was doing the right thing. But look what this dude does. Lord, help me. I'm like, I start telling this man, I'm, I'm going down the road to this church, but look, this is what's wrong. Boom, 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 boom. And everything that I told him, I believe was true. So I felt like I manned up. I felt like I did what I felt like. But I kind of had a little bit of the wrong attitude, if I'm honest. Self-righteous a little bit. And I'm being real. I'm being transparent, guys. Okay. Well, after I go to the new church, I meet some people that just left another church. And we were at Cuckoo's. I still remember, like it was yesterday. That was a long time ago. That was 23 years ago. And I still remember it like it was yesterday. Cuckoo's ain't even around anymore, yeah. right? So I was in Cuckoo's and I said, yeah, I told that preacher. Boom, 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 boom. And I was working with the youth. That afternoon, I called that woman up. She, went, she and her son were in the table. I said, sister, I am so sorry. I feel the Holy Spirit on this. The Holy Spirit loves us to humility. You know the word humble? You're not going to like this. The humble comes from the same kind of word as humiliate. Ooh, ooh. He was humiliated for you. Okay, but anyway, that's another story for another time. I'm a king's kid. He don't want me humiliated. Okay. Listen, so, so, so I called her up. I said, sis, what I did was wrong. If I did, so, and, oh, bro, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. No, no, I'm worried about it. <laughs> the Lord's all over me. Then I went to youth group that night, and I went up to her son. I said, young man, I'm going to look you in the eyeballs. I got to tell you something. I did the wrong thing. When I said that, like the way I said it, it was wrong, and I'm sorry, because I need you to know that young people need to see that there is something real about that. Okay? All right. So, hallelujah. Oh, it felt so good to be, to do the will of the Lord, right? And this is that time. Next morning, I get up 4 o'clock in the morning because the Lord is like, here we are, son. We spend the time together. I'm pouring my spirit out on you. And I'm making you a lover. I'm not a lover of your soul, boy. I'm causing you to walk with me. You're hearing my whisper. Everything's going so so good. Why was I sitting there feeling like I still had a monkey on my back at 4 o'clock the next morning? I said, why, Lord? <laughs> why do I still feel this way? He said, because you're not done yet, son. <laughs> you're not done yet, son. I'm like, what are you talking about, Lord? I'm done. I did. No, you're not. Call that preacher. Up. <laughs> Call that preacher. Up. Tell him. And I knew what he was telling me. I tried to talk to this one. I tried to talk to that one. I don't think that's the Lord. I don't think that's the Lord. I don't know. But at the same time, I'm thinking it's got to be the Lord because my flesh will not to do it. <laughs> Let me let you know a little secret, my friend. When it irritates you that bad, it's probably the Holy Spirit talking to you, trying to tell you to do it because your flesh is going to hate it. And the Holy Spirit loves it. Because you know what it's doing is it's cleaning out that old nasty bird bath. It's getting all that old nasty unclean water out of there. It's pouring some fresh stuff. Hallelujah from the springs or rivers of living water. And a place where the Holy Spirit can feel comfortable Hallelujah. to come back to. 
Amen. Scripture says for us to he, that he resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. Humble yourself, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. Singers, musicians, if you could come up, close us in a song. Amen. If you need prayer, I want you to know, man, we come to the altar and we can get our hearts right before the Lord. We can lay at the altar. Oh, but preacher, if I do that, you're going to know I have bitterness in my heart. Nobody knows what you have in your heart. The reality of it is, is this, is that we all got issues. Yeah. Come on, somebody, help me out. And listen, I'm just telling you that the Lord will minister to you if you come to the altar. But at the same time, you can do it in your bedroom tonight. I'm not trying to cause no, I don't cajole people to come to the altar. That's not what I do. Amen. But I will tell you this, if you'll allow him to minister to your heart, he will do it because that's the message of the cross in action. Amen. Let's